So we are taking a break in our long series through the Gospel of John this morning. And there's a good reason for that. We need, to, we need to talk about a subject that's not just biblically relevant, but especially relevant for our body here and now. And we're going to talk about uh, deacons, what deacons are, the role of deacons, the work God has in mind for deacons, and the possibility of us uh, adding some more deacons to our body in the near future. And so I'm excited to talk about this together. I want to let you know there are things that we're going to briefly go over in the text that are probably going to make you ask some deeper questions, and I'll talk about those as we go on. The purpose of this lesson is to not get real deep into the weeds. Uh, but that being said, if you have questions, please come see me afterwards. I'd love to talk to you more about some of this stuff. Uh, the reason for this lesson is to get you excited, to remind you of some things that Scripture says, and then to get us all collectively excited. I'd like to start here in this passage. This is in Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, we find one of the most beautiful passages that, that Paul ever wrote, in my humble opinion. It talks about the body of the church. It talks about unity within that body, how it is that unity is brought about by the Spirit. And it talks about the role that God has in mind for each of us in the context of our local assemblies. And so in this passage, Paul writes, so Christ himself gave and he begins to talk about some of the offices within local churches. He says he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. In other words, Christ himself has designated certain individuals within the local church to do certain things for the purpose of building the church up collectively so that we all might become more mature. But that's not to say that even though some people occupy positions in the church that others don't, that they're more important than anyone else. That's not at all what Paul is getting across. He says, then... We will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, listen to what he says, from him, the head, Christ, the whole body, joined and held together, listen, by every supporting ligament, or other translations say by what every part supplies, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. That's to say that every single member of this body that's gathered here today has a vital role to play in the body. But some of those roles are different than others. He mentioned, among other things, the evangelists. Let me share with you a passage that's uh, always been near and dear to me as I think about the work that God has called me to. And this is something Paul wrote to Timothy, who was a young evangelist himself. Timothy was in uh, Ephesus at the time, working with the local church. He was preaching and teaching the word. And this is what Paul says to him as he gives him instructions about the work that he specifically was called to do. He says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be ready, in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage, with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come, he says, when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires... They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from truth and turn aside to myths. But you, Paul says to Timothy, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. We find that in 2 Timothy chapter 4. As I think about my work as an evangelist and as a minister, this passage is always the forefront in my mind. Paul was reminding Timothy, you have a specific calling, a specific task, a, a specific work to be doing. And so he says, do the work of an evangelist. What is the primary work of the evangelist? To preach the word. 
But you look at the local church and all the things that happen on a, on a daily and weekly and yearly basis within a local church assembly, whether big or small, it's more work than one guy can do, right? And so Paul didn't say, Timothy, go to Ephesus and you do all the work. No, there were people needed to oversee the work of these local congregations. And so I would remind you what he also writes to Titus. Like Timothy, another young evangelist, he was left in the island of Crete to work with the local churches as they grew. And listen to what Paul says here. He says, for this reason, I left you in Crete. I've got a specific work for you to do. Not just preach the word, but this, that you might put in order what was left unfinished. That if the churches in Crete are going to grow, there's one very important thing you need to see to because it's work that's left unfinished. And what was it specifically? To appoint elders or overseers in every town as I directed you. If the local church was going to grow, it needed elders, overseers, shepherds to oversee the work of those local churches. They were the ones that were going to shepherd the church as it grew. And so, we find this passage. Think about the work of elders, or shepherds, or overseers, or bishops, or presbyters, all those terms used interchangeably for the same office within the church in the New Testament. In 1 Peter, Peter addresses the elders of the churches that he's writing to, and he says this, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, he writes, and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who will also share in the glory to be revealed. So we talked about Paul gives Timothy a job to do, right? Here's your work. Here's the job for you to do. Preach the word. What's the job of the shepherd or the elders or the local overseers? Be shepherds of God's flock. This is the task that they've been called to. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them. Not because you must, but because you are willing. And we're very blessed here to have six men that are willing to serve in that capacity. But this is what they've been called to do, as God wants you to be. He goes on, he says, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. First Peter chapter 5. So this is the work that they've been called to do. But this is what happens in the setting of a local church. If all of us are gathered together, we've got around 200 members that make up this body. That's not a tiny church. It's not a mega church. It's just, it is what it is. It's the people that God have gifted us with here in this family. But even in a church this size, there's several things to consider. Number one, you get a family of 200 people, there's a lot of stuff to see after, right? If you were a parent of 200 children, how busy would you be? You'd be pretty busy, right? Our shepherds, as they shepherd a flock this size, there's a lot for them to oversee. Consider also how busy we are as a congregation. One of the things that I love about our group is just how much stuff we are engaged in, not just for the sake of being busy, but we're about kingdom work. There's a lot of work to be done, work that we're actively engaged in. That takes oversight as well. Add to that the fact that we've been blessed here with a beautiful campus. A lot of facilities to take care of, but that's the key word, right? You've got to take care of them. And as things get old, things fall apart, and they need to be fixed, and they need to be repaired. You think about all those things together, and there's a lot of work to be done. And I want to share this with you. This is a slide that the elders use a lot in their meetings that I join them in, as they remind themselves of the work that they have to do. And I want to show you this for one very simple reason, so you can see how much work goes into overseeing a congregation even of our size. So they've got these four pillars. If you take all the things that they have to oversee, they've categorized them in four pillars. These are the foundations of the work that we're doing in the church here. And you think about evangelism, seeking believers and saving the lost, things like World Bible School, Marguerite Christian School, social media and online presence, uh, the missionaries that we support all over the world, the Bible studies that we're engaged in on a regular basis, educational resources, uh, reaching out to the community, all our community outreach efforts as we try to reach uh, the lost. Think about service, the pillar of service, community and each other. Our comfort cafe and the food pantry, how many of you work so diligently to make sure that that goes well? 
uh, Hands and Feet Ministry, the Good to Go Jack Ministry, Oasis and City of Children, Caring, Compassion, Prayer, Benevolence, Widows and Shut-Ins, all of these things fall under that category. You look at spiritual growth as we try to mature as a congregation together, growing into His likeness, into the image of our Savior. Worship services, Bible class, Bible studies, small groups, our various ministries, men's, women's, children, youth, uh, young adults, the Iglesia de Cristo and the wonderful work that they're doing with our Spanish-speaking members, VBS, uh, weekly uh, video log, something that they hope to do in the future as the elders communicate to us on a re regular basis, and then the fourth pillar, stewardship. You think, again, the, the resources God has given us and how we care for those resources. So church leadership, technology, media, finances, campus care, emergency preparedness, administration, business relationships, governance, family directory. That's a lot of stuff, right? It's a lot of stuff. And the question you might be asking yourself is, if our elders have to do all this stuff, when do they get to do the one thing they've been called to do, which is shepherd? Because if you spend all week doing this... There's not a lot of time left over, right? And so how do they get help to do these things so that they can focus on the shepherding that they've been called to do? With that question in mind, I want to take you to Acts chapter 6. Because at this point in the church's history, a similar question comes up, and I think it proves formative for us as we try to answer this question. How do the elders get some help in the work that they've been called to do? So in Acts chapter 6, the church is in its infancy, it's still in Jerusalem. It just exists as a phenomenon in Jerusalem. You've got people that gathered in Jerusalem from all over the Greek-speaking part of the world for Pentecost. There the Holy Spirit spoke through the apostles and Peter, especially he preached that first gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Over 3,000 souls were baptized and added to the church that day, and the church is growing in Jerusalem. And as it's growing, challenges arise. And this is one of the challenges so in Acts chapter 6, we read this. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the church is growing, the Hellenistic Jews, those are the Jews that had come from the dispersion, the Jews from Greek-speaking areas beyond Judea who had come into town, they complained against the Hebraic Jews, those were the Jews that were in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Remember, there's this beautiful description painted for us in Acts chapter 2 and 3. Everybody was selling what they had and giving the funds to the apostles, and they were overseeing, taking care of this huge group of people. And so food was being distributed, but some of the widows were being overseen. And so they complained about that. So the twelve, this is the apostles, gathered all the disciples together. They take this new church, they gather them together, and they said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word to neglect the ministry of the word of god in order to wait or serve on tables don't misunderstand what the apostles are saying they're not saying we don't care about these widows who need to be fed that's not what they're saying they're not diminishing the need of these widows on a regular basis they're saying god has called us to do something specific we are uniquely positioned uniquely qualified and uniquely called to do that work the ministry of the word the preaching of the word as the church is growing they need the word their position to do that anybody can help take care of the widows that's their point it would not be right for them to neglect the thing God had called them to do in order to do these other things that other people could be helping with and so here's the solution that they propose. They go on, they say, brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you. And I don't know why seven. The text doesn't say that. But seven men from among you who are known to be, they give qualifications for these men. Not just choose seven random men. Choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. These are the kind of men you're looking for. Men full of the wisdom, or excuse me, full of the Spirit and wisdom we will turn this responsibility over to them and that will give us the ability to turn our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word so we can focus on the thing God has called us to do we need to find some men who can do these other things that need to be taken care of now what do we learn from that well, one of the things we learn is 
this word pops up in the text. And what we read previously, when the, the apostles say at the end of this text here, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait, NIV has, or serve on tables, other translations have. That word serve appears, that's the verb form, the noun form appears in scripture several times after this, where it refers to servants in the context of the local church. It is where we get our word deacon from. But the word doesn't always mean a specific office within a church setting. And so you have to ask the question, what exactly is a deacon? What is a servant? Well, there's three broad ways that the term is used in the New Testament. Number one, it's simply used to refer to, in a generic sense, a servant who's been given a specific mission or a task. So if you have been called to, uh, I don't know, the early church raised some funds and that those funds need to be carried to another congregation, you might be a deacon of that work. You've been called to be servant in a general sense of that work, specifically that task. And I encourage you to, we're not going to look at all these references, but I've given you some so you can look at this on your own if you want. Number two, an assistant or servant to a specific or special person. So if my job is to serve maybe a dignitary or a person of higher rank than I am, or even in a very generic sense, a servant in, in a household setting, the term is used that way as well. But then it's also used in a very special way. It's used in regard to an office or a position within the local church. And I think we find it used that way specifically two different times. Number one in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1 where Paul opens his letter to the church in Philippi saying the letter is from him on behalf of him and the elders and deacons. And so when it's used alongside the elders there, I think it's used specifically to refer to an office within the local church. And then we find it, and this is the passage we're going to spend some time in this morning, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 8 through 12. So you remember we looked at Titus a few minutes ago and how Paul told Titus, I left you in Crete to appoint elders. After he says that in Titus, he gives a list of qualifications for the men who would serve local churches as elders. These are the kinds of men that you need to look for. He does the same thing in 1 Timothy chapter 3, except here he gives the list of qualifications for elders, and then he follows it up immediately with a list of qualifications for deacons as well. These are the kinds of men that you need to look for to serve as deacons in these local churches. So if you'll turn over there, let's look at this passage together. This is 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 8. So he just got done listing the qualifications for elders. This is what he says about deacons. In the same way, in other words, just as I gave you qualifications for elders, here's a list of qualifications for deacons. Deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths or mysteries, some translations have, of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In other words, they need to have proven that these are their qualities and the way that they've already interacted with the church. When you find men like that, these are the men qualified to serve as deacons. He goes on. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect. Now, I'm reading from the NIV here, just a, a note, and this is one of those things that you uh, will undoubtedly have questions about. Some translations have wives. Some translations have women. There's a very good reason for the difference there. And to ask the question, why is there a difference, is a very good question to ask. It's a very important question to ask. And please forgive me, but it's not within the scope of the time and the lesson we have today to get into the weeds on that subject. I promise we will at some point, and if you have questions, please, let's talk about them afterwards. But I just want to make sure you understand I am not dismissing the question you might have about that. I'm trying to focus us in on something specific as we move through the text today. Okay. In the same way the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything, a deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. These are the qualifications of a deacon. 
If someone is going to serve the church in that capacity, then you need to be able to look at that man and look at these qualifications and say, yes, this describes this person, this individual. This is not asking for a perfect person. This is asking for a man who fills these qualifications. Just like when the apostle said, okay, we need seven guys to help out with serving the tables here. Look for men full of the spirit and wisdom. The same goes for Timothy as he was trying to appoint elders and deacons in local churches. Look for men that look like this. And so I, I'm going to ask you to spend some time in this passage over the next couple weeks thinking about these qualifications. If you go back earlier in the lesson, I shared that slide that was our four pillars, right? And talked about all the things that the elders have to oversee. We need deacons in our congregation to help them do some of that work so that they can focus themselves in on the one thing God has called them to do, which is shepherd. So that they can shepherd, we need men willing to serve as deacons so that they can help carry some of the load under those four pillars. Now that's a lot of stuff, but what we've done is we've kind of condensed that list to think about some of the most pressing needs that we have as a congregation right now. What are the things that we really need to be focused in on? What are some things that we need deacons to help with right here, right now, so that the elders have some more time to shepherd? And these are the seven things that we've come up with. Number one, a focus on small groups. And we're going to spend a special Sunday here sometime this spring focusing in just on small groups. If you are already a part of our small groups, then you know how beneficial they are for community, for spiritual growth. If not, I want to encourage you to take advantage of them. But we want to expand the work that we're doing in our small groups, and we need a deacon to help oversee that. Worship coordination and enrichment, someone to help us in the organization of worship and to think critically about ways that we can worship God in more meaningful and moving ways together. Maintenance and cleaning, that's one that doesn't have a lot of glory attached to it, but somebody that we can call when something happens in this building to help us get the job done, right? Uh, right now, Coberto is doing a lot of that work, but if the shepherd's just taking care of the pen, he doesn't get to focus on the sheep inside the pen, right? We need someone to help take care of the facilities. Event planning and coordination, like I already mentioned, we're a busy group. We've got a lot of stuff. We've got a calendar in our office I will gladly show you. There's not many days that don't have writing in them. There's a lot going on. We need someone to help us organize and oversee that. Education, specifically with our children and youth ministry. We have wonderful children and youth ministries in place already, uh, but to help enrich those programs and think critically about uh, the material that we're sharing with our youths and how we are sharing that to help shape them as they grow. Community outreach. We can't just be focused inward all the time, can we? Because we've been called to do what? To take the gospel into our community and to make disciples of people. We need help with that. And then finally, to reach out to those who are only able to join us online. Our widows and our shut-ins. Those who don't necessarily have a family unit around them to serve them and care for them. That's where the church can step in and make sure that their needs are met. These are just some of the things that we need deacons to help take care of and help serve us as a local body. So we have six elders. We've got this pile of work to be done. And so you might be asking the question, well, how many deacons do we have right now? Well, we don't have deacons, plural, right now. We have the deacon. We have Mr. Steve Wexler, or Deke, as he likes to be called. Uh, he has been serving this congregation faithfully in that capacity for over 20 years. But that's too much stuff for one guy to do on his own, right? We need some more men to serve alongside him. And so I've asked Steve if he would like to share a message with us about his perspective on the need for help. And so Steve does not like to get up on the stage, and I totally respect that. But he was gracious enough to do a, a little video where he, I, I really moved by this, he poured his heart out into this video and I'd like to uh, share that video with you now so if you could turn your attention to the screen and just pay attention to what Steve has to share with you all go ahead Charlotte <laughs> really. I think the spirit was at work in Steve in that message yeah 
He does need help, and we need help. And the whole reason for this lesson is this. We have a handful of men who we believe match the characteristics of deacons as Paul gave them to Timothy, who are willing to serve our church in that capacity. And that is something to be very excited about. Uh, at the end of service, as Glenn leads us in a closing prayer, he's going to tell you who those men are. And so what we would like for you to do over the course of the next couple weeks is to be in prayer and be in study. As we bring these names to you, think about these men, if they fulfill the qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3. If you have any questions, we encourage you to talk to them about those questions. If you need help facilit facilitating a conversation with them, please reach out to myself or the elders and we'll make sure to make that happen. Uh, but beyond that, be in prayer. Because our plan is, uh, with the willingness and cooperation of the congregation, uh, to appoint these men as deacons in a few weeks and give the elders the help that they need in overseeing the work of the congregation so that we can move forward and grow. There's a lot of exciting plans we have. This makes me very, very excited that we have men that are willing to serve in this capacity. And so I hope you are excited as well. And so with that, the lesson is yours. Just a few things to be thinking about and being in, be in prayer about. But I want to do this, too, before we wrap up. I want to invite you to turn your mind to the cross. Because we are going to get ready to take the Lord's Supper, our communion, together in just a few minutes. And as we do that, I want you to think about what a blessing it is to be in the body of Christ. And as you think about the body of Christ, you think about all of us collectively making up that body but that this body only exists because his body was nailed to that cross and sacrificed on our behalf. And for that, we give God thanks and praise, and we celebrate the redemption that we have that's found only in him, in his name. So as you turn your attention to the cross, I invite you to stand. We're going to sing uh, this song together. And as always, there's an invitation extended. If we can serve you in any way, if you need prayers, if you need encouragement, whatever it is, please come forward and let us know. Let's stand and sing this song together. Lord, the light of your love is shining In the midst of the darkness shining Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us Set us free by the truth you now bring us Shine on me Shine on me, shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory, blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire, flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. shadows into your radiance. By the blood I may enter your brightness. Search me, try me, consume all my darkness. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Send forth your word.